Many in the West are still getting to know Asia, and North Korea remains quite a puzzle. Unlike anywhere else, this East Asian nation keeps its citizens under tight wraps, especially since the 1953 Korean War armistice. Led by eccentric and wary leaders, North Korea operates in such isolation that its inner workings remain a well-guarded secret. Only the accounts of spies and defectors give us a peek into this enigmatic reality. Let's delve into some of the mandatory rules that exist in North Korea. Foreign Entertainment Ban In North Korea, I Isolation is more than a policy, it's a way of life. The foreign entertainment ban is a stark reflection of the regime's iron grip on its citizens' lives. In a nation where information is meticulously controlled and international influence is viewed with suspicion, this policy is a powerful guardian of the regime's carefully crafted narrative. The foreign entertainment ban encompasses a wide spectrum of cultural expressions, from foreign films and television shows to music, literature and even fashion trends. Its core objective is to create a protective barrier around North Korean citizens, shielding them from what the regime perceives as the corrupting influences of the capitalist world. Fancy a Netflix and chill session in North Korea? Think again, it's simply not on the menu. Many brave North Koreans have resorted to smuggling Western media into the country, sharing these cultural morsels with their family and friends, offering a tantalizing glimpse into the liberated world beyond their borders. However, this seemingly innocent act of sharing foreign entertainment could easily lead to imprisonment in harsh labor camps or in the worst case scenario, a sentence of death. One striking example is an anti-Western film titled Propaganda, crafted by North Korean authorities. This film, clandestinely leaked to the outside world by defectors, was designed to highlight all that the regime believes is wrong with Western culture. It skillfully wove together hundreds of clips from TV shows, shedding light on perceived cultural, moral and political trends that, according to the regime, have corroded Western society. Even foreign music is not spared from the regime's scrutiny. In a chilling incident from 1992, a former regime propaganda officer, a woman, made the grave mistake of singing a South Korean song at a party. Her punishment was severe. She endured brutal beatings that left her unable to walk for a month, and she spent three long years behind bars. Kim Jong-un's aversion to South Korean culture extends to K-pop as well. The New York Times reported his description of K-pop as a vicious cancer, corrupting young North Koreans, attire, hairstyles, speeches, behavior. A human rights report from 2021 revealed that North Korea has publicly executed at least seven people in the past decade for watching or sharing K-pop videos. Furthermore, K-pop isn't the only genre the leader despises. In 2015, Kim Jong-un issued a decree to eliminate all cassette tapes and CDs containing songs banned by the state. All tunes played on the radio or by orchestras must receive the approval of Kim Jong-un himself, in addition to praising him and the ideals of communism. This means that enjoying the latest tracks from Coldplay or Rihanna is a distant dream for North Koreans. Even admitting knowledge of the lyrics to their songs can land you in deep trouble. It serves as a stark reminder of the stark realities faced by the people of North Korea and the extraordinary lengths the regime will go to ensure their adherence to its narratives and ideals. Four TV channels. In the hermetic realm of North Korea, where the government exercises unparalleled control over every aspect of its citizens' lives, the television landscape is no exception. Unlike most countries, which boast a plethora of channels catering to diverse interests, North Korea allows access to just four state-controlled television channels. This seemingly restrictive measure provides a unique insight into the regime's strategy for shaping public perception and reinforcing its ideological agenda. The first channel is KCTV Korea Central Television. Serving as the principal state broadcaster, KCTV acts as the official voice of the government. It is the primary platform through which citizens are exposed to a steady diet of propaganda, including the glorification of the Kim dynasty and coverage of official events. In addition to propaganda, KCTV airs cultural programs that adhere to the regime's ideological vision. The second channel is Mansudai Television, named after the Mansudai Art Studio. Renowned for its propaganda art, this channel focuses primarily on educational content. It provides lessons across various subjects ranging from language and mathematics to history and political ideology. Mansude Television also serves as a platform for promoting the study of the Yush philosophy, the state's ideology of self-reliance. Cheyuk TV, also known as Athletic Television, is the third channel, and it made its debut on August 15, 2015. This dynamic channel showcases sports competitions featuring North Korean athletes, along with engaging documentaries and programs that delve into the rich history of sports both in North Korea and across the globe. Tune in on Saturdays and Sundays from 19 o'clock to 22 o'clock and catch the Podo News program from Korean Central Television at 20 o'clock. 
The last one is Ryong Namsan Television, which primarily caters to residents of Pyongyang and nearby areas. Unlike the other channels, Ryong Namsan Television maintains an unpredictable schedule. It features seemingly random content, ranging from live traffic camera footage to scenic views and local artist performances. Despite its seemingly innocuous nature, even this channel plays a role in government control and surveillance. The limited selection of television channels in North Korea serves as a powerful tool for the regime. By carefully curating the content available to citizens, the government maintains strict control over the flow of information, ensuring its ideological narrative remains unchallenged. Any deviation from the sanctioned message is met with severe consequences, often including imprisonment or even execution. This unusual media landscape is not just about screens. It offers a revealing window into the regime's priorities and tactics for maintaining its grip on power. 28 Websites Only in the age of boundless internet access, it's hard to fathom a world where only 28 websites are permitted. Yet, in North Korea, this is the reality. The regime exerts extraordinary control over its citizens' digital lives, tightly restricting their online experience to a mere 28 approved websites. This unique restriction is not just a quirk, but a strategic move by the regime to cloak the country in secrecy. While the rest of the world surfs a sea of information, North Koreans find themselves within the confines of the Khan Intranet, a localized network hosting just 28 websites. At the forefront of this controlled digital realm lies Nainara, the official gateway to the North Korean regime's carefully curated online universe. Here, visitors are greeted with a barrage of government-approved news, propaganda and information, a vivid portrayal of the regime's narrative. Navigating through Nainara reveals a meticulously designed landscape. Citizens can delve into a plethora of news articles offering a unique perspective on world events, albeit one heavily filtered through the lens of the regime. From the latest orders of their leaders to the intricacies of the government's ideology, it's all served here. Beyond Nainara, the remaining websites delve into a limited scope of subjects. A handful provide insights into education and cultural facets, while others serve as conduits to government bureaus and essential services. For instance, individuals can explore the portal of the Korea Central News Agency, KCNA, the official news platform of the government. Additionally, there are websites dedicated to tourism and sports, despite the restricted travel options available to North Koreans. Access to these 28 websites is facilitated through the Kwang Myong Network, a domestically managed intranet separated from the global internet. This network acts as a digital walled garden, safeguarding the regime's control over information flow. The 28 website rule is more than just a digital restriction, it's a calculated move by the regime to safeguard its ideologies. These hand-picked websites predominantly serve as conduits for propaganda, meticulously shaping the narrative to align with the interests of the ruling elite. A considerable chunk of these websites venerates the Kim family dynasty, solidifying their status as revered figures within North Korean society. Their narratives are carefully woven into the fabric of every website, reinforcing the regime's grip on power. The 28 website rule not only limits access to information but stifles creativity, innovation and global connectivity for North Koreans. Their online world is a tightly controlled space filled with government-approved content. The lack of exposure to diverse perspectives hampers personal growth and intellectual development. As we surf the waves of the internet, it's crucial to remember those living behind the digital curtain, their online experiences restricted to a mere 28 websites. Dress code. In the fashion-forward world we live in, could you imagine your style choices leading you straight to jail? Well, in North Korea, even the iconic pair of jeans is contraband. While denim is a staple in America, it's practically a fashion felony in the hermit kingdom. To North Koreans, jeans aren't just a pair of pants, they're a loaded symbol of their ultimate adversary, the United States of America. The denim ban is a bold expression of their anti-West and anti-USA stance. It's as if wearing jeans would be akin to wearing a banner that says, I'm a fan of the Western world. But why the intense aversion to what many consider a basic wardrobe essential? It all boils down to Kim Jong-un's perspective. He views blue jeans as a Trojan horse of sorts, smuggling in the perceived corrupting values of the West. In his eyes, this simple piece of clothing poses a significant threat to the North Korean way of life. Rodong Sinmun, the official newspaper of the North Korean government, even went so far as to publish an article expressing concern about young North Koreans embracing Western fashion trends. They called for unwavering vigilance, urging people to resist any signs of a capitalist lifestyle creeping in. And it's not just blue jeans. A whole array of Western clothing items like t-shirts, skirts and suits are also off-limits. Instead, the government insists that citizens don traditional Korean clothing, like the beautiful and intricate hanbok. 
Now let's talk about the enforcement of this fashion law. If someone is caught sporting blue jeans or any other Western clothing items outdoors, they're in for quite the ordeal. They must wait patiently on the side of the road while the youth patrol swings into action, conducting a thorough inspection to identify other fashion rebels. It's like a scene straight out of a fashion detective movie. Once the patrol completes its mission, all offenders are escorted to the Youth League's office, where they must pen down confessions of their fashion faux pas. Only then are they allowed to return home, but there's a catch. They need someone to provide them with more suitable attire. It's a true fashion fiasco. This fashion frenzy is a stark reminder that style isn't just about clothes, it's about the cultural and political statements we make with what we wear. It's a way of cloaking the country in secrecy, maintaining an air of isolation from the Western world. In a land where individual expression through fashion is heavily controlled, citizens face a constant battle between conformity and self-expression. It's a vivid illustration of how deeply ingrained ideology is in every facet of life in North Korea. So, the next time you slip into your favorite pair of jeans, take a moment to appreciate the freedom of expression that comes with it. In North Korea, fashion isn't just about trends, it's about towing the line of political ideology. The denim dilemma serves as a poignant reminder that even the simplest of clothing choices can carry powerful political weight. Strict travel plans. In the enigmatic realm of North Korea, even the act of travel takes on an entirely different meaning. Within North Korea itself, the freedom to travel is a privilege bestowed only through official channels. Simple journeys from one city to another necessitate governmental approval, placing domestic travel under tight scrutiny. Venturing beyond the nation's borders is an even more labyrinthine process. To leave the country, North Koreans must secure an elusive exit visa or travel certificate. This privilege is extended sparingly, reserved for diplomats, select government officials and individuals with specific roles such as international athletes. Yet even with the coveted authorization to travel abroad, one is far from liberated. Each traveler is shadowed by government-appointed guides and vigilant sentinels ensuring no deviation from the established script. Their mission to shield the regime from exposure to foreign ideas and influences. For the majority of North Korean citizens, owning a passport remains an elusive dream. This deliberate restriction aims to thwart potential defections and minimize encounters with foreign perspectives. The borders with neighboring China and South Korea are fortified to discourage unauthorized crossings. The government views these borders not merely as lines on a map, but as fortifications against ideological contamination and the free flow of information. The consequences of breaching these travel restrictions are severe. Attempts to escape or evade the watchful eye of authority can lead to imprisonment, torture or even execution. Families of defectors face repercussions as a grim form of collective punishment. These controls extend beyond physical movement. They are a means to safeguard ideological purity. The regime strives to insulate its populace from external influences that could challenge its narrative. Exposure to the outside world is perceived as a threat to the regime's grip on power. Tourists, too, find themselves ensnared in this web of regulations. The illusion of unfettered exploration dissipates upon arrival. Every movement is meticulously orchestrated, monitored and scrutinized by the government. Solo endeavors are strictly forbidden as even using public transport or hailing a taxi is off limits. Guided tours choreographed down to the last detail are the sole, permissible mode of travel. For those seeking autonomy and spontaneity, North Korea is an inhospitable destination. It's safe to conclude that if you prefer your travels without the constant scrutiny and tight restrictions of a watchful hawk, North Korea might not be the ideal spot for that soul-searching or blissfully relaxed vacation you had in mind. Special Basketball Rules In the secretive world of North Korea, where basketball is a beloved sport, things take an intriguing turn. Kim Jong-un, the enigmatic leader of the nation, is known for his fervent love for basketball, especially his enduring admiration admiration for the 1990s Chicago Bulls and basketball icons like Michael Jordan and Dennis Rodman. In 2013, he orchestrated a memorable basketball match in Pyongyang, forming an unlikely camaraderie with the enigmatic Worm. But we also talked about his love for making his own rules. Yet it's not just Kim Jong-un's passion for the sport that sets North Korean basketball apart. Within the borders of this country, a unique and offbeat set of scoring rules dictate play. These peculiar regulations are said to have been set in motion by Kim Jong-un's father, the late North Korean supreme leader Kim Jong-il, and it's rumored that the current leader has added his own distinctive twist to them. In North Korea, slam dunks take on a whole new level of significance, garnering an impressive three points. Picture the electrifying spectacle of a powerful dunk. It provides a psychological boost to the dunking team and shakes the confidence of their opponents. Imagine if such a rule was adopted in the NBA, where players would vie to deliver gravity-defying slams at every opportunity. 
Stepping beyond the three-point line, North Korea rewards an astonishing four points for shots that don't even graze the rim. While this might sound like a dream come true for long-range shooters like Stephen Curry, Damian Lillard and Trey Young, implementing it in the NBA would require sophisticated rim sensors to accurately determine when a shot qualifies for those extra points. For every missed free throw, North Korea imposes a deduction of one point. In a league where notorious free throw strugglers like Wilt Chamberlain and Shaquille O'Neal became legends, this rule would have drastically altered their careers. NBA teams might scrutinize prospective draftees' free throw percentages even more closely, especially for big men. Perhaps the most perplexing rule, North Korea bestows eight points for any field goal made within the last three seconds of a game. This rule defies conventional basketball wisdom, favoring luck over skill and strategy. Picture an NBA Finals game where a team trailing by seven points snatches victory with a last-second buzzer beater. The drama would be off the charts. In a break from traditional basketball rules, North Korean games can end in a tie. Imagine the NBA Finals Game 7 ending with both teams declared champions, a scenario that adds an uncanny twist to the game's climactic moments. While these rules inject a sense of unpredictability and excitement into the game, it's clear that no reputable league, including the NBA, would ever consider adopting these extraordinary guidelines. They introduce excessive penalties, bestow unjustified rewards, and encourage tactics that would turn a typical basketball game into a chaotic and sometimes comical spectacle. Perhaps for Kim Jong-un, basketball is just another arena where he can exert his influence. While his rules may perplex us, there's no denying the passion and enthusiasm he brings to the game. As for the NBA, it will continue to adhere to its own playbook, where traditional rules and exciting gameplay reign supreme. Birth control. In the shadowy corridors of North Korea, a curious tale of contraband unfolds. Birth control, a simple but crucial tool in safeguarding health, is banned from both production and sale within the country. Dictator Kim Jong-un, with a vision of bolstering the nation's workforce, has imposed this prohibition. However, a clandestine market thrives with savvy entrepreneurs and officials voyaging to neighboring China, returning with these forbidden treasures to be bestowed as gifts. Smugglers, too, seize the opportunity, peddling them to prostitutes as a safeguard against both pregnancy and the spread of disease. A Chinese North Korean merchant traversing the borderlands revealed that condoms hold great appeal for both men and women in North Korea. They become prized souvenirs for officials returning from business excursions to China, creating a peculiar blend of political rhetoric and personal practices. Yet the intrigue deepens. Recent reports unveil a new directive that sends shockwaves through the country's medical landscape. North Korean authorities have barred healthcare professionals from administering birth control measures and abortions. This drastic move is born from a desire to combat the nation's plummeting birth rate, a trend spurred by the economic strains of raising a child in an isolated state. This momentous shift was announced during a healthcare workers lecture on October 8th, signaling a seismic policy change. Birth control procedures are now deemed illegal, and gynecologists who engage in these practices face severe legal repercussions. The directive extends further, forbidding gynecologists from performing abortions, though the exact penalties remain undisclosed. For physicians straying beyond their specialty, engaging in such procedures could entail a prison sentence of up to three years. The policy, however, remains silent on the punitive measures tied to the frequency of such procedures. The roots of this policy lie in the economic calculus of North Korean families. Burdened by the staggering costs of education and child-rearing, many couples consciously choose to have only one child. This deliberate limitation has contributed to the nation's alarming decline in birth rates, prompting Kim Jong-un to institute this sweeping ban on contraception and abortions. However, skeptics within North Korea view this policy as a mere drop in the ocean. The clandestine nature of these procedures, particularly among unmarried women, renders it an insufficient solution. The harsh reality of sexual assaults and prostitution in North Korea further complicates the issue. Parents, driven by concern for their daughter's well-being, often opt for intrauterine devices as a means of protection. Critics argue that the government should not interfere with women's birth control methods, but rather focus on creating an environment conducive to raising children. The central policy, they contend, transforms innocent individuals into criminals, underscoring the need for a more holistic approach. North Korea's birth rate now ranks 134th globally, painting a stark picture of its demographic challenges. 
As the nation grapples with these complex issues, the dialogue surrounding reproductive rights and family planning takes center stage in the evolving narrative of North Korean society. This is a testament to the struggle between state mandates and personal choices in the quest for population growth. Approved hairstyles. In the tightly controlled realm of North Korea, even hairstyles fall under strict scrutiny. The regime maintains a meticulous list of government-sanctioned hairstyles for both men and women, deviating from these approved Options can result in severe consequences. For men, styles like spikes or the use of hair gel are strictly prohibited. Likewise, women are forbidden from having layered cuts or sporting bob hairstyles. Hair salons in North Korea prominently display illustrated guides showcasing the only permissible cuts according to the authorities. Remarkably, under Kim Jong-un's rule, North Korean women are presented with a selection of 15 approved hairstyles. Curiously, their hairstyle options are even influenced by their marital status. Married women are expected to maintain shorter hair, while unmarried women have the privilege of wearing longer styles, often adorned with delicate curls. Meanwhile, North Korean men also have a palette of 15 approved cuts to choose from. They face stringent restrictions against letting their hair grow beyond 5 cm. However, older men are granted a slightly extended allowance of up to 7 cm. Ironically, Kim Jong-un himself excluded his own distinctive hairstyle, known as the ambitious, from these regulations to preserve its uniqueness. Yet reports emerged that Kim Jong-un had commanded men to emulate his iconic look, with violators facing the prospect of having their hair forcibly trimmed by authorities. This directive was particularly enforced within universities, where students were reportedly cautioned against adopting any styles associated with capitalism. While men and women in the hermit state have reportedly been issued an illustrated guide of approved hairstyles, none of the 15 styles appear to match Kim Jong-un's infamous haircut. The leader's iconic coif seems to be off-limits to the general public. Finnish journalist Mika McLennan captured snapshots of two posters that supposedly outline the permitted haircuts during a visit to Pyongyang. This revelation casts a curious light on the carefully curated world of North Korean hairstyles. As the 70th anniversary of the founding of the North Korean regime approaches, special inspection units are reportedly being dispatched to public areas. The Central Committee has issued directives to eradicate non-socialist phenomena, including unconventional fashion choices and hairstyles that deviate from the socialist lifestyle. In this fascinating tapestry of North Korean life, even personal style becomes a reflection of political ideology and societal control, offering a unique glimpse into the intricacies of daily life in this enigmatic nation. Foreign currency. In North Korea, a peculiar dance with currency unfolds. Officially, the North Korean won holds sway, but its true value is a far cry from stability. Instead, it's foreign currencies like US dollars, euros, Japanese yen, and Chinese yuan that oil the wheels of the nation's economy, especially for the ruling elite. International sanctions, imposed to curb nuclear tests and missile launches, have further strained the country's economic fabric. In this landscape, foreign notes emerge as beacons of stability, propping up the regime's coffers. Meanwhile, the native North Korean won, relegated to everyday transactions for ordinary citizens, remains a currency of relative insignificance. A recent twist in this financial tale reveals North Korea's ban on the use of foreign currency, with citizens subjected to random street searches and their yuan and dollars confiscated. The mandate? Exchange foreign currency for the domestic won. Yet trust in the won has eroded over time, a legacy of hyperinflation in the 1990s and 2000s, culminating in a 2009 revaluation that left many citizens' life savings in tatters. This shift towards a one-only policy might signify preparations for a complete result of trade with China, potentially marking a pivotal juncture in bilateral relations. Historically, bans on foreign currency issuance have preceded periods of heightened trade activity between North Korea and China. The ban on foreign currency in 2010, swiftly lifted due to rampant inflation, reflects a prior attempt to impose the revalued one on the public. This time, however, it appears to be part of a broader strategy to amass foreign currency reserves for an anticipated revival of trade with China, potentially in the near future. Amidst this financial maneuvering, one thing remains clear. The people are unlikely to relinquish their foreign currency without a fight. Who wouldn't want to fight back? Confiscation efforts, while aggressive, are met with resistance as individuals safeguard their financial interests. The policy's enforcement unfolds in neighborhood watch meetings, where residents possessing foreign currency are mandated to convert it to domestic currency under threat of random police searches. This echoes the sentiment of tigers hunting for prey, illustrating the palpable tension surrounding the issue. In this climate of uncertainty, most residents harbor a decidedly negative stance towards the ban on foreign currency as the wheels of change continue.
continue to turn, North Korea's financial landscape remains as enigmatic as ever, with implications that ripple far beyond its borders. Real estate. Rules often bend in North Korea and the housing market is no exception. While the law strictly prohibits buying, selling or renting houses, a quiet revolution has been underway for the past 15-20 years. Slowly, North Koreans have begun to trade properties, challenging official regulations. The idea of owning property in a land where it's legally impossible might seem baffling to outsiders. However, a unique exception exists for houses privately owned before 1958 and still inhabited by the original owners or their descendants. Such cases, though scarce, represent a form of de facto private property. Residents hold residency certificates, a form of proof of residence issued by municipal authorities, which are highly regarded. Despite lacking legal property rights, these certificates grant residents a sense of ownership and control over their dwellings. This sense of ownership has emboldened individuals to buy, sell and even rent out their homes. When a transaction occurs, both buyer and seller visit the local city council to obtain a new residency certificate in the buyer's name. This process, surprisingly, doesn't require exorbitant sums. A pack of cigarettes or a bottle of liquor may suffice. Though a modest monetary payment is also expected, well, that's a bit cheap. Over the past decade, North Korean real estate prices have skyrocketed, particularly in Pyongyang. A decent modern house can now fetch around $100,000, while the median price hovers between $70,000 and $80,000. Remarkably, this surge in property values extends beyond the capital, challenging the belief that economic progress is confined to Pyongyang. In a nation where private enterprise is officially banned, black markets have become a lifeline for essential goods. Despite strict prohibitions, officials often turn a blind eye in exchange for bribes. Kim Jong-un's regime has somewhat relaxed its stance on unofficial private enterprise, particularly in sectors like mining, though state ownership remains the norm. While Apple products and other Western technology brands are officially banned in North Korea, exceptions exist for the elite. In staged photographs, Kim Jong-un has been spotted beside what appears to be an iMac computer, hinting at a fondness for Apple products. This affinity for Western tech may not come as a surprise as North Korean homegrown operating systems have shown striking similarities to Apple's OS X. North Korea's underground markets continue to defy convention, painting a picture of resilience and adaptation in the face of strict regulations. No disrespect. In the land of the Kim dynasty, disrespect is a path fraught with peril. Three generations of supreme leaders hailed as dear leader wield divine authority, making any slight a taboo of monumental proportions. This isn't a matter taken lightly. Punishments extend far beyond the grim spectre of capital punishment. Enter the grim three generations of punishment rule, introduced by Kim Il-sung in 1972. Is it a chilling premise? If one individual is convicted of a grave crime and dispatched to a prison camp, their entire immediate family marches alongside them. Even the next two generations born within those grim confines find themselves bound to this fate. Kim Il-sung laid the foundation for this ironclad tradition. His successor, Kim Jong-il, held the title of chairman and dear leader, while the current torchbearer, Kim Jong-un, goes by supreme leader or the dear respected one. Journalists who neglect to affix these titles with due respect are swiftly admonished and reminded to always remember the leader. Every North Korean sports a pin over their heart, a badge featuring the visages of Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il or both. These emblems, not up for sale to foreigners, carry an air of gravitas that goes beyond mere trinkets. They're a statement, a symbol of unwavering allegiance. In this regime, allegiance is non-negotiable. Each citizen must pledge loyalty to the Kims, their kin and the state itself. Any hint of insult, a mere whisper of dissent is met with the harshest of rebukes. This doesn't apply only to locals. Even immigrants and visitors must tread with utmost caution. The stakes are high, as a mother faced potential imprisonment for choosing to save her children over a portrait of Kim Il-sung during a fire. Homes must serve as shrines, displaying portraits of revered leaders subject to regular inspections. Neglecting these symbols of authority, even allowing a speck of dust to mar their visage, is a grave offense. And it doesn't end there. Falling asleep during a meeting where Kim speaks, that's considered a capital offense. Just ask Hyun Yong Chol, North Korea's defense minister executed in a chilling display of power for alleged lapses. A United Nations report in 2013 aptly labeled them as one of the dreadful tools in the regime's arsenal of fear. Recent accounts from defectors reveal a heart-wrenching truth. Even children are compelled to witness these macabre displays as men and women meet their end by hanging or firing squad. Criticism, even in jest, is perilous. In 2016, North Korea prohibited sarcastic remarks about Kim Jong-un or the regime, quashing any hint of dissent. 
These weren't mere words, they were seen as acts of defiance. For the brave few who dare to speak out, the consequences are swift and brutal. Families are torn apart and sent to political prison camps, a grim testament to the cost of disobedience. So in this realm of reverence and reprisal, the rule is clear. Show respect or face the consequences. Disrespect is not just a transgression, it's a gamble with one's very existence. Secure the poop. Back in 2008, when South Korea decided to cease sending fertilizers to their northern neighbors, North Korea found itself grappling with a real stinker of an issue, a fertilizer shortage. But as history has shown, necessity is indeed the mother of invention. In true North Korean fashion, a novel law was enacted, calling upon its citizens to contribute their own organic gold, 100 kilograms of it per person annually, to support the nation's agriculture. This peculiar initiative reflects the regime's determination to overcome challenges through resourcefulness, even if it means turning to unconventional methods. North Korea's approach to agriculture has often been marked by resilience in the face of adversity. With international sanctions and a scarcity of conventional fertilizers, the government sought alternative means to nourish its fields. Thus, the concept of utilizing human waste as a valuable resource emerged. The 100 kilogram requirement per person might seem substantial, but it underscores the seriousness with which the government views this initiative. Citizens are urged to collect and contribute their waste to designated authorities, where it is then processed and transformed into fertilizer for agricultural use. While unconventional, this approach isn't entirely without merit. Human waste is rich in organic matter and nutrients, making it a potentially effective fertilizer. It's also readily available as every citizen generates waste daily. By harnessing this resource, North Korea aims to bolster its agricultural productivity and reduce dependency on external sources. However, there are concerns to address. The practice must adhere to strict hygiene standards to avoid health risks, both during collection and processing. Additionally, the effectiveness of this unconventional fertilizer may vary, necessitating rigorous testing and quality control measures. In a nation accustomed to resource scarcity and self-reliance, this practice is a testament to North Korea's determination to innovate when faced with adversity. While unconventional, it reflects a broader trend in the country's history of adapting and finding solutions to pressing challenges. As North Korea continues to explore unconventional solutions, it remains to be seen whether this unique practice will yield fruitful results or encounter unforeseen challenges along the way. One thing's for sure, when it comes to agriculture, North Korea is not afraid to think outside the box, or should we say the compost bin. For more videos like this where we explore the lifestyles and rules that exist in countries, just click on the videos displayed on your screen. Keep watching, we are coming back with more. See you soon.